Uh, I'm Rachel Heckman, and um, as Tam said, I came to this paper, um, hi, <laughs> um, for a class that I took last semester, um, I heard from somebody that I knew that harness racing had been big here um, in Kalamazoo in the 19th century, uh, but I also knew that um, Christianity was also big here in the 19th century. Kalamazoo is part of what we like to call the Bible Belt that stretches all the way up to Grand Rapids and a little bit beyond. Um, so I was wondering, why is harness racing a big deal in an area where the church also has a lot of influence? Because um, I think we all are aware that horse racing doesn't exactly have the best reputation. Um, so that's what kind of brought me to this uh, research project. Um, as I found out and as I'll talk about tonight, harness racing actually has a much different reputation than what we're going to call flat racing. Uh, so that's going to be the topic for tonight. So. We're going to start in the 1970s. In the 1970s, the Kalamazoo Gazette published a retrospective on harness racing here in Kalamazoo. Uh, the reporter who was writing the piece called Kalamazoo a little Lexington. Um, if you know anything about horses, you know that Lexington, Kentucky is the horse racing capital of North America. Um, but this reporter called Kalamazoo a little Lexington as if um, comparing Kalamazoo with Lexington, Kentucky was pretty self-explanatory. Uh, but it's not. Um, the latest agri agricultural census in 2012 uh, put the number of horses here in Michigan at uh, around 87,000, which is just a little over half of the 150,000 horses you can find in Kentucky. Uh, furthermore, um, Lexington, with its bluegrass and fertile fields, has two top-ranked uh, horse racing tracks at which um, some of the uh, world's most important horse racing events uh, take place. Uh, they've also produced such internationally famous horses as Man of War, uh, who we all know uh, raced against Seabiscuit in the 1940s. So why did this reporter refer to Kalamazoo as a little Lexington? Um, he was writing about our horsey past. Between 1830 and 1930, Kalamazoo played host uh, to between three and four um, internationally known harness racing tracks. Um, a world record was set here. Uh, and the standard bred, which is the only breed of horse permitted to race in harness, owes its modern constitution to a horse that was born and raised on a field that is now Western Michigan University. Um, so Kalamazoo, with its special combination of farmland and factory, um, is a really good look into the complex relationship that we as Americans have and always have had uh, with horse racing. So one of my goals tonight is to get you guys thinking about the way that you interact with sports and what we're going to call leisure activities. Um, my research tonight falls under the broad umbrella of what is called sport history. Uh, sport history is more than just a list of statistics and who played for what team and who scored what goals. Um, it's about studying how people, in our case Americans, interact with um, the ideas of leisure and how they spend their free time. <clears throat> so first I want to explain some of the lingo I'm going to be using tonight. I don't know how much you guys know about horses, I'm just going to assume you know nothing. Um, so there are four main differences between flat racing and harness racing that are going to be essential to understand um, as we talk about harness racing tonight. The first is speed. Um, thoroughbred racing, also called flat racing there on the left, um, is run at a speed that can reach up to 40 miles an hour, uh, which is about the speed of West Main. Uh, that's the speed limit. And harness racing is run at a slower speed. So if we're talking Olympic terms, um, flat racing is gonna be a 100 meter dash, and harness racing is gonna be more of a uh, mid-length run that emphasizes uh, endurance over uh, short-term speed. The second important difference is the gait that's used. So there are three different kinds of gaits. There's the gallop, the trot, and the pace. And those are the different ways in which horses move. The gallop, I think we all know, um, is a pace in which all four legs are moving independently of each other. It is the horse's fastest moving gait. Um, in the movies, they always show horses galloping for hours and hours and hours. They really can only gallop for a few minutes at a time, which is why flat racing is so short. They call the Kentucky Derby the fastest two minutes in sports. So this is actually one of the first photographs ever taken of a moving animal and what is considered the first movie 
Um, this is what, is what proved to us that horses, when they gallop, actually lift all four legs up off the ground, which was a kind of revolutionary idea at the time. So you can see here how it's moving, right? All four legs up off the ground, all four legs are moving independently of each other. The gates that we're most concerned with tonight are the trot and the pace. The trot is also a natural gait, which means that all horses can do it. Uh, it's much slower. And as you see by this diagram, the offside legs move together. So when the left front foreleg moves, the back right foreleg moves. <clears throat> Trotting is a very comfortable uh, speed for a horse to move at. It can trot upwards of several hours at a time. The second uh, one of the two that we're concerned with is called the pace. It's very similar as the trot. It's a similar speed. It looks almost the same, except in the case of the legs. So in the trot, the offside legs move together, and in the pace, same side legs move together. Uh, the important thing to know about the pace is that it's not a natural gait. Um, a horse is born knowing how to pace, but not all horses can pace. Um, and when you talk about harness racing horses, when you have a new bred, uh, newborn colt or filly, it will tell you very soon whether it prefers a pace or a trot. Usually a horse that can pace very well cannot trot very well and vice versa. So there are going to be two different kinds of harness racing races, trotting races, and pacing races. Um, the next most important difference between harness racing and flat racing is the gear involved. This is a picture of American Pharaoh right before he won the Kentucky Derby. And as we all know, he went on to win the Triple Crown. Um, so you see how he's set up for the race. He just has the bridle, the bit, the saddle, and the jockey. You want to be as light as possible when you're flat racing because the goal is to go as fast as possible. When you're talking about harness racing, you notice that there's quite a bit more gear involved. You have what's called the sulky, which is where the jockey sits. You have a whole bunch of ropes and leather bits, and a lot of pacers will actually wear stuff around the legs in order to keep them from tripping over themselves. Here is a diagram of all the different types of equipment that's needed in harness racing. And a lot of this is, this is safety uh, related. In the early years of harness racing, it was very common for sulkies to get their wheels locked and for the sulkies to flip and that would throw the jockeys under the legs of the oncoming horses, which is never a good thing. And the fourth and most important difference between flat racing and harness racing are the breeds involved. On the left there, we have what's a, a thoroughbred, which is the typical um, flat racing horse. And here on the right, we have a standard bred. Now, this is the only kind of horse that is allowed to race in harness. And the standard bred has only been around for about 130 years, so it's a relatively new breed. Um, really neat thing to know is that it's an entirely American breed. We invented the standard bred here in the United States. So you see they actually do look very similar, and that's because the standard bred does have a lot of thoroughbred in them. But you'll also see that the legs are a little bit thicker, the neck is a little bit thicker, the back's a little bit longer. It is a different horse. So here are the main horse breeds that go into making a standard bred. Uh, the most important, of course, are the thoroughbred and the Morgan, which is also an American horse, which we developed in about the 1840s. So it is a very American horse. But what we're concerned with tonight are what I'm going to call the moral differences between flat racing and harness racing. So I'm going to talk tonight about class differences, economic differences, the ways in which harness and flat racing were used differently, and the different nature of the two sports. <clears throat> so the first is class. This is a painting of a very famous um, racetrack in England. This was done in the late 1700s, around the time of the Revolutionary War. Prior to the war, lower class Americans um, associated flat racing with the aristocracy. Uh, the colonial gentry, so upper class Englanders who came to the New World, tried to establish their dominance using uh, horse racing, which was an understand, understood form of cultural expression. So you'll see in this painting that uh, the people who are watching are all upper class. They're all wearing very fashionable clothes, they're all on horses of their own, and horses were very expensive. And this is one of the main differences between the lower and the upper classes prior to the Revolutionary War. The upper class could afford to race horses, while the, up, the lower class could not. 
<clears throat> Racing horses required a lot of money. Purebred thoroughbreds were very expensive, as they still are. Um, and in the New World, you'd have to pay to have them shipped from England because thoroughbreds were not common in North America. So you not only had to pay for the horse, you had to pay for the transportation of the horse, you also had to pay for the jockey, and you had to pay for the trainer, and you had to pay for people to take care of that horse because you had to take care of it differently than you took care of a regular cart horse. So uh, flat racing um, cost an incredible amount of money, which is the, one of the reasons that it's called the sport of kings. The second difference is economics. Because of the upper class association that flat racing had, um, this kind of negative connotation of the king's sport carried into the 19th century. This is a painting by a famous illustrator done right after um, the Revolutionary War, right around the time of the French Revolution, where aristocrats were very unpopular. We were cutting their heads off. Um, this uh, portrays a bunch of people um, in a hazard room, which is a room where people went to gamble away their family money. Do you, does this look like a very um, nice depiction of pe the kinds of people who would gamble in a room like this? No, not at all. Very unflattering. Um, Americans are very concerned with developing a nation that was the opposite of this. They were very concerned with the idea of civic virtue, the idea of a republic that was founded on principles that abhorred behavior like this. So we're concerned with ideas of thrift and sobriety and frugality um, and other kind of um, self-control. Um, flat racing implied loose morals uh, for these people because not only do you need to spend an incredible amount of money on these animals that you don't actually use for practical purpose, any practical purpose whatsoever, um, you're spending an unseemly amount of money on what is essentially playtime. And that flies in the face of um, any kind of civic virtue. Uh, furthermore, flat racing is going to be associated with upper class vices, like are depicted in this drinking and gambling and um, loose women. These are all kinds of behaviors that have become associated with racing because of the behavior of the European upper class. So this is all flying in the face of what we're going to call the Protestant work ethic, right? We don't want to look like this. We are strong and sturdy people who are dedicated to being virtuous and um, you know, capitalists and working for our money. So in contrast to flat racing, harness racing was uh, basically a celebration of utilitarianism. Um, Many people owned trotters, the kinds of horses that were very good at trotting and could try at long distances, um, by the first few decades of the 1800s, because these kinds of horses were practical not only on the farm, but also in the city. Um, harness racing emphasized these incredibly practical attributes um, and improved upon them. So trotters were not only um, relatively well-known and easy to um, access, but they were actually pretty affordable. Um, so unlike thoroughbreds, which were pedigreed and very expensive, and you paid a lot of money for a horse that came from other horses that had also been sold for a lot of money, um, a harness racer in the early 19th century was any horse that could trot or pace a mile in a given time. And that time changed as the, the years went on. But it was basically a meritocracy of horses. If your horse could do the stuff it needed to at a certain time, it was a harness racer. So as a result, most early harness racers were actually workhorses. During the week, they pulled, uh, they pulled plows, they you know, carried wagons uh, in the city, and then you know, on days off, then they would go and race. But primarily, they were work animals. The most significant difference um, is what I call Trotter's democratic nature. Because it is so utilitarian and because it's so accessible, um, the emerging middle class that came out of mercantilism in the 1820s um, sees harness racing as the extension of the democratic processes that brought the United States about. So not only are we voting, we are, it's a you know, government of the people, by the people, but our sport is also a sport that anybody can get involved in. And by anybody, we mean the middling class. <clears throat> Excuse me. So 
it's really an activity that prizes achievement and personal merit over pedigree, over wealth. And so it's really something that the middle class grows to appreciate. And it becomes the American alternative to the sport of kings. We don't have kings in the United States. We don't have flat racing in the United States. We have harness racing. So this is a Courier and Ives print from the 1860s um, that depicts just a whole bunch of country boys having a harness race on a city street. Um, so basically, these horses would have been used to carry them to and from the city uh, and the farm, would have been pulling plows, would have been pulling milk wagons. Um, but here, uh, you know, over the holiday or whatever, they're racing. So I'm going to give you guys a brief early history of harness racing. It's going to make sense in terms of Kalamazoo in a little bit, but I want you guys to understand how Kalamazoo fits into the bigger patterns before I dive into the details. So this is a pic, picture of uh, what is called the historic track in Goshen, New York. It was the very first harness racing track ever to be opened in the United States. It was in 1838. <clears throat> so this is important because harness racing really begins in New York. Um, New York City bans galloping uh, fairly early on, and it leads a trend of cities banning galloping um, the first few decades of this um, 19th century. The smooth paved roads of New York City were actually very dangerous for horses going at high speeds. They could trip, they could twist their ankles, they could chip their hooves. Trotting was much safer. Um, so you have kind of public opinion and you have practical reasons um, encouraging the growth of harness racing as a sport in New York. Uh, by mid-century, most cities had followed suit, uh, banned galloping in the city limits. Um, and so harness racing became a very popular leisure activity for those who could afford horses, um, which, as the 19th century progressed, became more and more people. Uh, in the er very early 1820s, um, this was really only the richest farmers and merchants, but even by the 1830s, a majority of what we would call the middle class um, could afford horses and could participate in harness racing. So in 1824, we already have the very first trotting club formed in New York. It was the same trotting club that eventually formed this Goshen uh, racetrack. So this really marks the beginning of trotting's um, institutionalization as an official sport. But the really important thing to know about the New York Trotting Club is that their purpose was very utilitarian. They said, we love horses and we want to make horses better as a breed. Therefore, this club's purpose is to find the fastest horses and the strongest horses and the best looking horses so we can breed them and make future generations of strong workhorses. That was the point. That was the whole point of harness racing. <clears throat> so by the 1830s, 1840s, harness racing is becoming an egalitarian sport. Lots of people are involved. Uh, it's particularly getting popular in the countryside, whereas urban racers um, had clubs and um, tracks to, on which to race. People living out in the country um, did most of their harness racing at what were called agricultural fairs. Uh, we would call them county fairs. So they were events mostly during the summer and fall in which people would come together to show off their livestock, show off their crops, look at how good of a farmer I am, and the purpose of these fairs was not just to show off, but it was really to um, find farmers to which you could sell your livestock, find farmers who had livestock that you wanted to buy. So you're improving agriculture as a whole by meeting other farmers and breeding your livestock and buying their seed. Um, so this is a picture of an um, agricultural fair of 1858 in St. Louis. So you'll notice that it looks like a regular county fair. It's got lots of people. It's got buildings. It's got outbuildings. But it also has a racetrack. So that's pretty important to know. <clears throat> so it's the point of the reason why these things are so important um, to know about the agricultural affairs is that because it proves that harness racing was seen as a practical utilitarian uh, activity. It was not a sport. It was not a leisure activity. It was something fun to do that also encouraged uh, strong breeding practices um, and resulted in stronger workhorses. So the 1860s are kind of interesting when you're talking about horse racing. Um, it was a watershed moment for a lot of things in the United States, um, but it was really uh, kind of the touchstone for horse racing as much as it was for politics and economics. Um, 
there has always been a regional difference in the way Northerners and Southerners do their horse racing. Antebellum Southerners have always preferred flat racing because the uh, aristocracy was very proud of its uh, relationship to the aristocracy of Europe. Um, Northerners, on the other hand, definitely preferred harness racing. So the difference uh, can be linked to the sectional tensions that are popping up in the 1850s. People are associating flat racing not only with the aristocracy of the 18th century, but with the um, kind of profligate behavior of the slave owners of the 19th century. So flat racing kind of now has two bad raps. Not only are the kings doing it, but the slave owners are doing it. So it's definitely not something that northerners are a fan of. <clears throat> but the end of the war destroyed the southern aristocracy, right? It wrecked them uh, economically, and it destroyed their farms. So they, flat racing kind of became a non-issue in the south. So there was a vacuum um, of, there was room for a new sport to emerge. So we see a renegotiation of sport and sporting spaces in the 1860s, um, not only in horse racing, but also in the rise of spectator sports like baseball. Baseball really takes off in the 1860s. But it's the technology that's introduced and fostered by the Civil War that is really important for what we're talking about tonight. Um, railroads, for instance, they're going to be linking turf cities in the east um, with these kind of growing cities in the Midwest and far west, like Chicago um, and cities in California. So whereas harness racing had always been kind of an eastern activity, now you have the railroads. You can transport your horses to new turf cities. You can go and visit new turf cities. So it really opens up racing uh, to a broader span of people. Um, also, the opening of the West after the Civil War, when we're laying the railroads, um, that really opens up uh, possibilities for harness, for horse racing, flat racing in particular, to be rebranded as something that cowboys do, manly, strong men do it. It's not necessarily a Southern aristocratic thing anymore. Um, the telegraph is also um, starting to become a big deal, especially by the 1860s, and it's providing a larger audience for horse racing, because not only now can you race horses in new cities, but you can telegraph the results to people across the world. <clears throat> so by linking these far-flung cities um, with the railroad and uh, the telegraph, horse racing became much more accessible and popular and more profitable than ever in the 1860s. Um, and this is actually a political cartoon that was published during the uh, presidential race of 1864 between George B. McClellan and Abraham Lincoln. And um, you see they're in a harness race together. And McClellan is having trouble because his two horses, War and Peace, are not agreeing with each other, whereas Abraham Lincoln's horse is pulling ahead. So the parallels are pretty clear, I think. So by the 1870s and 1880s, harness racing took on a new flavor. Uh, the end of the Civil War kind of triggered a, an industrial boom here in the North, uh, which is going to catapult a lot of middle class Americans to the elite. Um, so a lot of people who were originally from the middle class suddenly had all this new money. And they're going to be coming into kind of old wealth circles and pushing out aristocratic and genteel ideas and replacing them with middle class ideas. So we really see this in harness racing because as this middle class rose to the top layers of society, they start pushing out flat racing. Um, so flat racing becomes really popular again in the 1860s and then becomes less popular in the 70s and 80s. Part of this is now because um, trotters are seen as symbols of industrial progress because we have um, at least two Captains of industry or robber barons, however you want to refer to them, getting involved in harness racing. Uh, John D. Rockefeller and Cornelius Vanderbilt were both very big trotters. And this is actually a very famous Courier and Ives print of harness racing in New York. And I believe it is this guy who's supposed to be Cornelius Vanderbilt. So we have a bunch of captains of industry getting involved in trotting at the highest levels. <clears throat> for these aristocrats, harness racing is a way for them to embrace their new upper class ide um, identities without giving, getting rid of their middle class um, backgrounds. However, because of 
Cornelius Vanderbilt and Ron, John D. Rockefeller getting involved and being willing to pay very high prices for harness racing horses, they kind of inflated the price of harness racing at every level. So in the 1870s and 1880s in particular, we start seeing the upper class getting involved in horse breeding. So they're able to afford a lot of horses, these big husbandry farms, especially in upstate New York, where they're churning out dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of new horses every month, which enables you to find the best horses faster than somebody who is working on a farm in you know, the middle of nowhere, Kalamazoo County. So it's going to inflate the price of harness racing across the board. Horses are now more expensive. It's harder to get um, accepted to the prestigious races because you have famous racers buying up all the spots. Um, so this is actually a huge problem because it starts to push out rural and lower income um, participants from the sport. Um, and this was actually widely remarked upon in the 1880s. People were very upset at what they saw as an elitization of harness racing, but it really was because they could no longer afford to race at the same levels that uh, the upper class was racing at. Um, I think I read somewhere that one of Cornelius Vanderbilt's horses cost $20,000, which is an insane amount of money in 1870. That is an incredible amount of money. Um, for comparison, a horse, a very famous horse, was sold in the 1900s for $20,000, which was considered high. So $20,000, 35, 40 years earlier, that's actually pretty impressive. So the same breeders who are really insisting that harness racing is egalitarian and democratic, um, as they're churning out all these horses, they're also importing bloodlines. They're bringing fancy pedigreed thoroughbreds over from England and breeding them with their harness racers. And so the same breeders who are saying, oh, this is so democratic, are actually introducing pedigree and aristocracy into the bloodlines. So we start to get a kind of a muddling of the waters in the 1880s. So by the 1890s, harness racing had really begun to move out of the realm of the middle class. Most of the participants were no longer middle class. Um, people who were racing were very wealthy. They were not doing so much at the county fairs anymore. Um, and the rise of gambling at horse racing events um, in the Gilded Age, which is about 1880s to 1900, really starts to concern people in the middle class. So not only is harness racing too expensive for them to participate in anymore, it's becoming a kind of a moral black hole. <clears throat> uh, New York harness racing tracks became professionalized uh, around this time, and uh, the rates of bookmaking and corruption at these races made headlines across the country. People were just, they were beside themselves. So the last decade of the 19th century, the 1890s, sees this wave of anti-gambling sentiment across the United States, which is going to predicate what the kind of reforms that we see in the progressive era a few years later. But people are really upset at the kinds of uh, things that are going on at harness racing tracks. And some of this is coming out of kind of a racist understanding of the kinds of people who are going to be going to races. Uh, the middle class was saying, oh, we can't trust that these new non-English speaking, non-white immigrants are going to know the difference between right and wrong. So they're, they're going to go to these races, they're going to see the gambling, and that's going to destroy immigrant communities and drag the rest of us down. The author of an 1880 history of Kalamazoo County was actually pretty cynical about racing. Um, he said that the entire business of trotting and racing was a gambling scheme and every race is thus fixed and a fraud. Um, and so that was in the 1880s. So that's just kind of a, a taste of how upset people were starting to get in the 1890s. So maybe they tolerated private betting in the middle class, but it was the, um, the institutionalization of gambling at a state and local level um, that really, really turned the middle class off of harness racing. So let's get to the stuff you guys all came here for. <laughs> how does harness racing fit in with all those patterns? Um, this is actually... Uh, something I found on eBay. A lot of Kalamazoo harness racing paraphernalia is available on eBay um, being sold from other countries, which I think is really interesting. So if you want some, you can usually get a postcard for like nine or ten bucks. I did. Um, this is an ad for some of the grand circuit races in Kalamazoo, which we're going to talk about. 
in 1919. So you can see how high the purses are getting. $50,000 for a one race, that's incredible. <clears throat> and you can also see how far these are being advertised. This is um, Appleton, Wisconsin, which is about the middle of the state. The first harness racing track in Kalamazoo dates back to 1837, which if you know your Kalamazoo history is only six years after Kalamazoo Village was founded in 1831. It's only 13 years after the New York Trotting Club was founded in 1824. Um, and the track was called the Burr Oak or the Axtell, um, the, the Burr Oak or the Axtell track. Uh, kind of reports differ, but they usually refer to it as one of the two. Uh, no 1830s record exists that I can find of its location, but I think it may have actually been right around the corner, the, um, the corner of Burdick and Lovell. Um, so here is one of the sources that indicates that it was just around, literally around the corner from here. Uh, touched the center of Burdick Street at its intersection with Lovell Street, which, and thence it circled in a grand mile sweep to the southward, enveloping a large share of what now con constitutes the Den Bliker addition to the village. So we have a harness racing track that starts right here and goes for probably about half a mile because the circle in itself is a mile. Um, so that's taking up a large uh, portion of what we would now consider downtown Kalamazoo. So here is a map of where we are. We're right here. And then here is the um, intersection of Lovell and Burdick. So we have the track going like this for about half a mile. So that's, like I said, literally right next door to where we are right now. So here is the article from the Kalamazoo Gazette in 1837, it's been around that long, um, that announces the forming of the Kalamazoo Jockey Club that a year later would open the Axel track in 1838. So you don't have to read the whole thing, um, but there are a couple things I want to point out about this article. <clears throat> so like the New York Trotting Club, the aim of the Kalamazoo Club is to uh, form and improve a track for training and improving horses. I think it says that in the very first paragraph. Yeah, up in here. So that's important to know because they're getting together to train and improve horses. They're not getting together to party. They're not getting together to gamble and have a good time. They're getting together for very practical breeding purposes. <clears throat> and I also want to um, point out the people who are involved in the forming of the Kalamazoo Jockey Club. Uh, the Gazette makes a very uh, a point to refer to them as respectable. <clears throat> we have, um, well, we have General Burdick, who's president, and Burdick is important because he's a founding member of Kalamazoo. Um, Burdick Street, right next door, is named after him. Um, and we also have Charles E. Stewart, who is the chairman of uh, the club, and he is also a founding member of Kalamazoo. Uh, but the, both of these men are actually from New York. Uh, well, New England, anyway. Stewart is from New York, and Burdick is from Vermont. So uh, a majority of the men who are founding the Kalamazoo Jockey Club are coming from New England middle-class values. They're coming from New York. They're coming from places where harness racing is a very popular leisure activity. So they're bringing these um, East Coast um, morals to Kalamazoo. <clears throat> and it's interesting to know also, uh, Burdick and Stewart came to Kalamazoo County in just about 1835, 1836. So it did not take them very long once they got settled here to start the Jockey Club. This would have been the first things that they would have done as an institutionalized group. Let's get together, let's race horses. So Kalamazoo harness racing is not an isolated event. It's definitely coming from uh, very strong New York, New England roots. Uh, so harness racing is increasing in popularity in the 1840s and 1850s here in Kalamazoo, just as it was um, in the rest of the country at large. Uh, here in Kalamazoo, though, we definitely put an emphasis on speed trials at agricultural fairs. <clears throat> so this is an excerpt from an article in the Kalamazoo Gazette. Uh, from 1856, um, in which one of the very first classes, it was a very long article, it would span almost an entire page of the newspaper, with all of the different kinds of horses that are being judged um, at this agricultural fair in 1856. Um, so we'll see that the best do-all work horse uh, will win $5, which is 
actually a large amount of money for the time. Um, a dual workhorse or a roadster is actually um, uh, another word for a trotter or something, a kind of horse that you would use for harness racing. I'm calling it a do-all workhorse emphasizes the practical nature of harness racing horses. Not only is it fast, not only can it trot really well, but it can also pull a wagon or a plow. So it's suggested by the rise of trotting and agricultural fairs here in, especially in 1840, um, Kalamazoo really becomes heavily involved in the racing scene in the 1850s. Um, this is an excerpt from the same 1880 history of Kalamazoo that I was talking about. Um, in which the author is discussing the founding of the Kalamazoo Town Agricultural Society for Improving the Breed of Horses. Um, they sh quickly shortened the name to National Horse Society, which is a lot easier to remember. Um, so they're being organized in 1858. Um, that's because the Agricultural Society was seen as being too broad. There were too many things other than horses. Um, and so the National Horse Society is miles more popular uh, than the agricultural societies because people in Kalamazoo really only came to the agricultural fairs for the horses. So they're going to be comprised of about a hundred gentlemen, mainly citizens of Kalamazoo in the county, um, but know that there are also some really important men coming from nearby cities, Detroit, Coldwater, um, and Jackson County in particular, even though it's not mentioned there. So the federal government recorded roughly 1,600 horses in Kalamazoo County in 1840, by 1860, there were 5,500 horses. That's almost a 400% increase uh, in only 20 years. Um, that's incredible. Kalamazoo accounted for 5% of the, all the horses in Michigan, uh, which put it in the top 10 horse-owning counties at the time. Uh, so the Kalamazoo Town Agricultural Society would host agricultural fairs into the 1860s, uh, but the National Horse Society um, was founded specifically for having horse fairs. So <clears throat> their point was to exhibit, breed, and race fine horses in the name of um, better breeding practices. Uh, so here is an article from the Michigan Farmer, which is an agricultural magazine that was widely read throughout the state in the 19th century. Um, the author is observing, this is in 1859, that the farmers of the state have been attempting for several years to improve Michigan horses um, and then he goes on to say that the use of trotters in the breeding practice is going to widely improve the efforts. So you can see how important trotting was to Kalamazoo and Michigan as a whole. Not only are they getting together and racing them, but they're also very, very keen on breeding them. So in 1858, the Kalamazoo National Horse Association voted to open a new track. Uh, the Axel track is probably still in existence at this point. Uh, but they decided to open a new one, which they called the National Driving Park. Um, and this track was actually widely considered the finest track um, in the North at the time. Um, and in 1858, a full three days of harness racing in October uh, was immensely popular. So this is a plat book of Kalamazoo County. Some of my students will recognize this from class. Um, so we are, yeah, so the National Driving Park is going to be in this corner right here. Um, the, the track went from Stockbridge Avenue down to Reed Avenue, which is just cut off here. So it's this entire um, section of the Edison neighborhood of Kalamazoo. Uh, Portage Creek comes right down here. Um, this is the railway, and I-94 uh, is going to come down through here uh, later. This is from 1910, so I-94 is not there. So here is a map from an atlas of uh, 1873. So there we can see Portage Creek up there. We can see Stockbridge Avenue, uh, or where it would be. This is where Stockbridge Avenue now is. And this is the National Fairgrounds, or the National Driving Park. Um, so you can see it actually takes up a fairly large plot of land, probably about a mile and a half square. It's, uh, it's a big deal. And there is uh, the National Driving Park plotted on a map. So you can see it's the uh, Edison neighborhood here. Um, circled. And then this is I-94. So it's actually um, just about five minutes, five, ten minutes from here. It's a neighborhood now. So in 1858, we have the first opening of um, the National Horse Fair. And we have a Detroit Free Press reporter who attends. And he remarks 
um, that the people who had rushed to the grounds early in the morning retained their positions on the first day, despite what is reported as a torrential downpour, and estimated that about 10,000 spectators were there on the first day. That's an insane number for 1858. Um, but what's more important is the presence of the Detroit journalist. Um, Detroit's about two hours away from here by car, so you can imagine how long it would take for the journalist to get from Detroit to Kalamazoo. So it had to be kind of a big deal for him to make it all the way down here. Um, but the reason that he came is because Kalamazoo is located on the rail line about exactly in between uh, Detroit and Chicago. <clears throat> so um, Kalamazoo was reportedly, reportedly flooded with strangers in 1858. Um, and despite the relative obscurity of the event, um, horsemen from all over the region came because of the railroad made it really easy. Uh, oh, this is a picture of uh, the National Driving Park entrance. The record I found said that it was from 1887. I don't actually think that this, that is the case. I think it's from uh, 10 or even 15 years earlier based on what people are wearing and based on the fact that there were no harness races um, there in 1886. So that date's wrong at some level. So here is the um, uh, article in question of the uh, from the Detroit Free Press in which the uh, journalist is talking about really how awesome the Kalamazoo race was. He could not stop talking about how sweet it was. You see the first paragraph, he goes on and on and on and on. He waxes poetic about everything that he was seeing. Um, and I actually just cut him off at some point because he just went on for paragraphs upon paragraphs. Uh, the Michigan Farmer also published a very positive review of the fair in 1858, um, talking about how it's really um, going to be the initiation of a series of exhibitions going to improve the stock of horses. So it was really fun, and it's got great potential for improving breeding in the county and in, in the state, which is the point of harness racing. However, it's really in 1859 that puts Kalamazoo on the map um, in terms of harness racing. Um, Flora Temple was a nationally known harness racer. She was very fast. Uh, we have a couple of Civil War boats from the north that are actually named after her. One of them sank off the coast of Maryland, I believe. Um, so on October 15, uh, three nationally known harness racers, including Flora Temple, came to Kalamazoo for the races. And it was a very anticipated, a highly anticipated race because these racers had never raced all three of them at the same time before. These people are coming from all over, they're coming from uh, Canada, they're coming from Chicago, they're coming from Detroit to watch them race. And not only does Flora Temple the favorite win, but she sets the world record. She trotted a mile in two minutes, 19 seconds, and 34 fourths. So this is, um, she wins a $2,000 purse, which is an incredible amount of money. But over 10,000 people watch her break the world record for harness racing. Um, and this really catapults uh, Kalamazoo uh, to the front and center of harness racing. Um, you have the Washington Post even commenting on the race um, at hand. So you have, um, at least what I could find, you have the Washington Post, the Chicago Tribune, the Detroit Free Press, the Sandusky, Ohio Register, a couple of newspapers in Cincinnati, um, and a couple of papers in Kentucky. Uh, talking about Flora Temple winning the race and setting the world record. So, and that's all because of the Telegraph. Uh, the Ohio Register called uh, the Kalamazoo track the best track in the Union. Um, and the Detroit Free Press called Kalamazoo um, the greatest trotting in the world. So it really gives Kalamazoo a place in national harness racing uh, and shows how it progressed from kind of a rural pastime to in here in Kalamazoo to um, kind of a national spectator sport. So the 1860s um, also is a really great example of how, how Kalamazoo embraced the technology um, that is starting to uh, spur harness racing and horse racing onto new heights. Uh, so this is a picture of the construction of the Michigan Central Railroad um, in roughly 1856. It didn't open until the late 1850s. Um, but this is the um, station that I believe is now on, uh, it's the Amtrak station, if I'm not mistaken, um, downtown Kalamazoo, I think. I'm not quite sure. Um, so I talked a little bit about how Kalamazoo is located on the Michigan Central Rail Line. 
Uh, well, it's this location that really uh, provides a direct major link to cities like Chicago, Detroit, uh, St. Louis, um, and Boston and New York. Uh, a couple of other smaller railroads were built in the 1850s, also intersecting through Kalamazoo, connecting it with Grand Rapids and Big Rapids and Flint and so on. Um, so Kalamazoo is actually a very well-connected city in terms of railroads. Um, <clears throat> so it's pulling a lot of people in from cities that ordinarily wouldn't have come um, to visit. At the same time, roughly around the time of the construction of the railroads in the late 1840s, you have the telegraph that comes uh, to Kalamazoo. So Kalamazoo is be able to immediately communicate with people across the world. Uh, people are coming from all over the region to see the races. Um, so racing here in Kalamazoo is a big deal. In 1868, we have a number of, in the 1860s, we have a number of tracks being opened in other cities. Uh, in Kalamazoo County, Galesburg opened a very popular track in 1868, um, which didn't close actually for a while. So these new technologies um, not only allowed spectators from all over the Midwest to come see the races, but it allowed for the importation of horses from all over the country to race. Um, in 18, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the Detroit Free Press noted that in 1859, the winners of various prizes at the races came from Wisconsin, Ohio, New York City, and Chicago. And in 1861, we had competitors from Kentucky, which was a big deal because Kentucky was a border state during the Civil War, and Canada. So you have horses coming from all over the world. So by 1865, the Chicago Tribune observed um, that prior to the war, Kalamazoo could have sustained uh, the fairs on its own. But after the war, the, fair, the horse racing was so popular that if the railroads were to close down, they would no longer be able to have the fair or any of the horse races because it was the outsiders that were supporting uh, the major racing industries here in Kalamazoo. Uh, so I also uh, mentioned the Telegraph. In 1866, the Chicago Tribune published its annual piece on the Kalamazoo racing in the fall. Um, and they published a special thank you to the Kalamazoo uh, Telegraph operator, whom they estimate sent 20,000 words on horse matters there at the end. So I thought that was kind of fun. <clears throat> so in the 1870s, we, I don't really see that the Kalamazoo really um, kind of embraced or condemned the 1870s shift towards elitism that I talked about earlier. Um, However, harness racing did kind of decline in the 1870s. Um, in 1871, we have a spectacularly poorly attended race at the National Driving Park. Um, only 600 people came, um, and there were only three horses that ran, and that's a far cry from the tens of thousands of people who were coming um, in the 1860s and 1850s. In 1872, we have the Michigan State Fair held at the National Driving Park. Um, and the Kalamazoo Gazette remarked that the railways would be running special trains so that people could come and see it. But they also noted that the premiums offered to the breeders of the state for speed are liberal enough to call out a full competition without holding any temptation to the sporting fraternity. In other words, this was kind of a jibe or a jab at the um, elite uh, racers in Michigan. So there's a lot of money to be had, but not quite enough that it's going to make any of the rich people come and race here. Um, so this is a picture of um, uh, Beck's Place, which is a saloon in the Haymarket District of downtown. And I don't know if you guys can read this, but you have wines, liquors, tobacco. Um, there's another picture that was taken at the horse, and you have vaudeville posters up. Uh, so you start seeing some more of the vices with harness racing start to crop up in the 1870s and 1880s. Um, when the Michigan Horse Breeders Association met in the 1870s, um, they decided not to hold it at the Kalamazoo track, which made a lot of waves. They actually decided to hold it in Grand Rapids, which was seen as a snub to Kalamazoo because Grand Rapids literally just opened their track that month. Um, so Kalamazoo was very offended, but at the same time, not a lot of racing is happening in Kalamazoo anymore. This is the National Driving Park around 1876, and instead of being used as a race course, uh, the Grand Army of the Republic, which is a veterans association for men who had fought in the Civil War, um, held an, like a week-long encampment, a reunion of, of types, on the fairgrounds instead of using it for racing. Um, so the fairgrounds are starting to be used for more than just racing. 
Um, a national or a history of the fair of the county from the 1880s reports that the National Horse Association actually stopped holding races altogether in the late 1860s because of poor attendance. If you only have 600 people, that's not going to maintain your property. Um, and they sold it to somebody who in the 1870s uh, tried to host races a few times, but really there's just not enough money in it. Nobody was coming to see him anymore. So he closed it down um, by 1880. So the evidence seems to suggest that it's the abhorrence of gambling um, that's starting to become the main cause of harness racing's decline here in Kalamazoo. Um, 1875, the Michigan State Fair banned any kind of harness racing horses because of gambling. Uh, and later that year, the Michigan Association of Agricultural Societies met here in Kalamazoo for their annual conference and decided if they were going to uphold that or not, if they were going to continue to have harness racing at their fairs. And for the most part, they decided, yes, we're going to continue harness racing. But it was a plain male delegate um, who said, you know, harness racing is good, but it's the gambling that we're not a fan of. So in the 1870s, um, the Michigan uh, Agricultural Societies descend, decide to continue racing, but they're also going to ban alcohol and ban gambling of any kind anywhere near the grounds of the races that year. So I'm going to talk briefly, well, that says Peter the Great, um, about champion trotter Peter the Great, because I think that he shows, uh, he's a really good bridge for Kalamazoo between the 1880s, 1890s, um, and the races of the, night of the 20th century. <clears throat> so this is Peter the Great. This is a picture um, from a piece on him in the Kalamazoo Gazette in the 1940s. This is a picture right after he won the Kentucky Futurity, which is kind of like the Kentucky Derby of harness racing. Um, and I think it was, I think, 1899, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so Peter the Great is born in 1895 um, on the farm of a man called Daniel D. Streeter. Um, he owned what is um, he called the Oakland Stock Farm, and that is going to be uh, right here. Here's the plot map of his farm in 1910, which is about the same farm that he had when Peter the Great was born. Um, and I think uh, Western Michigan University's campus now stretches this way, if I'm not mistaken, because that's the Amtrak line that comes through and interrupts some of my classes with the horn. Um, so Peter the Great is a uh, descendant of Hamiltonian the Ten, who is the original harness racer uh, in, from the 1840s. He is initially pretty unremarkable, uh, but he did win the Kentucky Futurity, which meant that he had it in him somewhere. Um, he was trained here in Kalamazoo. Uh, a lot of people will say that he held his first race at the National Driving Park, but I couldn't find any records to back that up, especially because the park wasn't running races anymore at that point. Um, but he raced and won at the Kentucky Futurity in 1897. And he um, swept the heats the next year and set a whole ton of new records. Um, and in 1901, he was sold for $20,000, which was astronomical for a horse. A couple of years later, he was sold again for $50,000. So if $20,000 is astronomical, you can imagine how much $50,000 was. So Count Peter the Great is pretty important because he won a couple of races. But the most important thing that he did was provide the foundation for the modern standard bred breed. Most historians say that he's most important because of his role as a sire. Uh, one estimates that up to 60% of modern harness racing horses today are descendants of his. That's an incredible amount of money. So here is the pedigree of Winsong's legacy, um, a horse that actually just died, won what is the triple crown of harness racing in 2008. So you can see this is his first pedigree. So Volamite is his great-great-great-grandfather, and Volamite is the grandson of Peter the Great. So Winsong's legacy is Peter the Great's great-great-great-great-great-grandson. Um, and I just really Googled, like, latest harness racing winner. Uh, I came up with that, um, and he happened to be related to Peter the Great. I'm sure I could have done that with any of the most recent uh, champions and come up with the same results. So Peter the Great really illustrates Kalamazoo's uh, fading influence in harness racing. He was quickly sold to more lucrative regions like upstate New York. 
Um, but also the sport's increasing emphasis on pedigree over performance when you're talking about harness racing. So the fact that Winsong's legacy um, is a grandson of Peter the Great is a bigger deal than the fact that he won the Triple Crown of harness racing. <clears throat> so Peter the Great's national success seems to have invigorated the harness racing industry here in Kalamazoo, for at least for a brief amount of time. Uh, Kalamazoo joined the Grand Circuit in 1908. That was a string of cities all across the United States that hosted major harness racing events every year. Uh, it was kind of like the triple crown of harness racing um, in the early 20th century. Um, the Washington Post remarked that it is not uh, expected that the inauguration at Kalamazoo will be as big an affair as in the days when it occurred in Detroit, but the racing should be okay just the same. Um, so the reason that Kalamazoo got the spot was because uh, Cincinnati pulled out because of some reform issues in the city. Um, a whole bunch of progressives decided that gambling is not for Cincinnati. So Kalamazoo got the spot instead. And it was considered pretty perfect because it's halfway between Chicago and Detroit, and also only about an hour from Grand Rapids, which is also a uh, Grand Circuit City. Um, and this, I actually, this is the postcard that I own. Um, it depicts uh, racing uh, at the new racing park, which I'll talk about in just a second. Uh, this is a Grand Circuit meet. So these are horses from all over the country. They're champions. And they're racing here in Kalamazoo. Um, the Grand Circuit seemed to be, uh, actually proved to be remarkably popular. Um, these races were held at Recreation Park, which is sometimes referred to as Exposition Park, like it was in the postcard I just showed you. Um, here's another plot map from 1910 that shows the location of Recreation Park. So we have a one-mile racetrack and also a half-mile racetrack. So you can have multiple kinds of races here in Kalamazoo. Um, and... <clears throat> Let me show you one more. Here is the modern location of Recreation Park. If you guys know anything about Kalamazoo, you'll know this is the site of the current Kalamazoo County Fairgrounds. So the Recreation Park eventually became the Kalamazoo County Fairgrounds. Um, and you can tell uh, the legacy continues because the Kalamazoo County Expo Center is on the site of the old Recreation Park um, main building, also known as Exposition Park. So that's why it's called Expo Center. <clears throat> so in the weeks up to leading up to the first Grand Circuit, people were pretty much over the moon about harness racing coming back to Kalamazoo. Uh, a reporter remarked that the grounds were spick and span, um, and they had been because they had been renovated for the occasion and only opened about a week before the race had started in 1908. Um, and the first Wednesday of the event, they called Kalamazoo Day and shut down all the schools and all the factories in Kalamazoo so that all the residents could come and watch the races if they wanted. So it was very, very, very popular. Um, and betting, which had been outlawed by the state of Michigan in 1888, uh, wasn't actually an object of concern, at least immediately. Um, the Gazette uh, suggested in 1909 that anti-betting laws had only drawn more people to Kalamazoo to watch the races because there was no betting. Harness racing was a safe activity, a family-friendly activity, so a lot, of, a lot more people were coming to the racetrack than would have come ordinarily. Um, so Kalamazoo's 24-year run as part of the Grand Circuit was supported, at least in part, by what we'd call middle-class virtues of uh, thrift and sobriety and frugality. The anti-betting legislation passed at the state and local levels um, reassured people who were concerned about horse racing's um, slide into immorality. Um, Peter the Great's national success would have gone a long way to convince people that harness racing still was a rags-to-riches meritocracy. Uh, you know, a small-town boy from Kalamazoo could still go and make it big uh, without necessarily the, um, being raised with a lot of pedigree or on the fields of Kentucky. So it also seems that the failure of harness racing here in Kalamazoo is also linked to those same ideas. Um, in, in 1932, which is the first few years of the Great Depression, um, Kalamazoo had to cancel Grand Circuit Week. They, didn't, they literally didn't have any money with which to run the races. 1931 um, had been run at a great loss, and 1930 races had only happened because uh, citizens of Kalamazoo donated money to the cause. 
So the city really didn't feel like it had a whole lot of capital um, to go into debt for the Grand Circuit races. Um, and the Gazette noted that uh, to do otherwise would really be foolhardy, especially in the middle of the Great Depression, which hit southwest Michigan pretty hard. Um, the death flow to Kalamazoo harness racing is going to be the legalization of paramutual betting, which is a form of, of trackside betting, in 1933. Michigan is one of at least 10 states who legalized betting at the state level during the Great Depression because it was a form of income for the state government. Um, and really, in the depths of the Great Depression, you're going to take money over morality almost any day. So um, the economic benefits of legalized gambling simply outweighed moral opposition to it. I couldn't find a copy of the 1933 law because it has been since repealed. Um, so everywhere you go to find it, like the act will say, act such and such, repeal. Like, that's nice, but I need to know what it said. Um, so there is uh, something from 1931. Michigan Penal Code um, still says, hey, anyone who is caught um, publishing gambling records, gambling at all, is going to be subject to fines and jail time, unless it's related to harness racing. So you're already starting to see some loosening up in 1931, which is around the time that Kalamazoo has to start shutting down the Grand Circuit races. Um, so here is bits and pieces of the 1933 law from a unrelated... Um, court case in Detroit a few years later, uh, 1946. So you'll notice that um, people who are licensed to own tracks, um, and it should not be considered unlawful or um, any, you know, no matter what any other laws say, betting is still legal and is now legal in the state of Michigan, uh, but it can only be done at the track. <clears throat> so. Kalamazoo, which is still overwhelmingly rural and middle class at this point, reacts really, really strongly to this news. Um, it, to, for lack of a better word, harness racing dies in 1934 here in uh, Kalamazoo. They try to bring it back in 1934. Um, a Grand Rapids company came down, re-renovated Recreation Park, uh, opened up some races, and they were so poorly attended that they literally closed it a week later. So few people came that it was, it was just not going to float. Um, so they tried to bring it back in 1937, 1939, 1940, and each time the attempts failed. And in 1940, the owner of Recreation Park donated it to the city of Kalamazoo uh, to serve as fairgrounds, which they still are to this day. Uh, in other words, residents of Kalamazoo felt strongly enough about the immorality of betting the legalization of, of betting in 1933 undid over a century's worth of harness racing history. So the example of Kalamazoo really proves how tightly linked harness racing is with ideas of morality and virtue among the middle class in the 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, its connections are connections to New England through Stewart and Burdick and others. Uh, provides an explanation for why trotting started here so early compared to the rest of the region. Um, and then uh, our, fair, our fondness for agricultural fairs um, kind of explains why harness racing took off here in the, 19, in the 1840s and 1850s. The rail lines laid in the 1840s led to even more people coming to Kalamazoo to watch the races. Um, and then when the upper class claimed harness racing for their own in 1870, uh, Kalamazoo racing failed uh, because the middle class was really disenchanted with what was becoming an increasingly elite sport. Um, and then finally, the rise of Grand Circuit racing in 1908 during the staunchly anti-betting progressive era, um, and then the rapid failure upon the legalization of gambling at the state level, really shows how closely Kalamazoo people, residents of Kalamazoo held uh, their dedication to morality and anti-gambling and other ideas that are pretty uh, characteristically middle class. Um, it shows just how high a premium that um, Kalamazoo residents placed on notions of propriety and frugality um, and morality. Um, so this harness racing still is here in Michigan. Um, you can see more harness racing in south, the southwest Michigan than really any other part of the state unless you go to Detroit. Um, there are, there is one harness racing track that is still hosting 
uh, events, and that is Northville Downs, that's close to Detroit. Um, Hazel Park, which is, I believe, between Detroit and Flint, hosted harness racing up until January of this year, and it only recently uh, canceled it. Um, so there are a couple of major events up there at the top, but the best place to see harness racing here in southwest Michigan is still at the county fairs, which I think is pretty great, because that's where harness racing got its start here in southwest Michigan, was at the agricultural fairs. Um, so you see that there's a question mark by Jackson. Um, there have been multiple efforts since 2008 to bring a track to Jackson County um, on which to do harness racing. And it keeps getting shot down in the legislature because um, if there's harness racing here on the west side of the state, nobody will be going to the east side of the state. And the owners of the parks there really depend, apparently, on western Michigan money. Um, but hopefully, a track will open here soon. Um, and we'll get some really quality harness racing here. Um, the Michigan Harness Horsemen's Association has a lot more information on places you can go um, and see some actually pretty exciting events. And I, I've gone over time, so I don't want to keep you, but that's all I have. So if you guys have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, that's it.